So we've now spent two whole videos talking about timers and the theory of how they operate and the registers for setting them up. Let's actually use them to do something useful now. So I briefly hinted at and showed a preview of this back in the first timer video. We have a circuit with a single LED and we want to blink that LED, but we are going to do it using an interrupt instead of delay commands. So when I run this simulation, you can see the LED will just turn on for a second and then off for a second. But in my code here, I don't have any delay commands in the while loop, and I have a single interrupt service routine up at the top here that is using the XOR bitwise operator to toggle the LED on and off. And then in the bulk of my code, in the main function here, I have a bunch of registers, including the TCCR1A and TCCR1B registers we saw in the previous video, and two new registers, OCR1A and TIMSK1, that we have not seen yet. So let's talk about what these, re these registers do and how we can use them to set up and enable a timer interrupt. So first, let's have a reminder about what a timer in normal mode is doing. So we're going to look at timer 1, which is 16-bit and has that maximum value of 65,535. So in normal mode, the timer is going to start counting at zero and just increment up until it hits that maximum value, wrap around back to zero and keep going, giving you that sawtooth wave. Now that is in normal mode, but remember in the last video, we saw this big table with a bunch of different modes we could select for the timer. In this lesson, we are going to use clear timer on compare mode, which allows you to select a value somewhere in between the bottom of the bottom and the maximum values. And you pick that value using the output compare register. So there are actually two of these available, but in the code you saw at the beginning, we were using one of them, OCR1A. So you can pick a value and write a value to this register that is somewhere between zero and 65,535. And as the name implies, that will clear the timer or reset it to zero when it reaches that value. So instead of letting it count all the way up to max, it's going to hit whatever value you've picked for this register and then it's going to reset. And we have an additional register, the TIMSK1 register, that allows us to enable an interrupt whenever that happens. So whenever the timer counts up to the value we've picked, it's going to clear the timer, reset it to zero, and generate an interrupt so we can jump to our interrupt service routine. And you can see how we are now generating interrupts at a set frequency. And by changing the value in this output compare register, we can increase or decrease that frequency or change that period. For example, if we move that output compare register up, it's going to take the timer longer to reach that value. So we've spaced our interrupts out more. This period is longer. If we move that interrupt, sorry, if we move that output compare value down, the timer is going to reach it more quickly and these interrupts are going to happen more often. And just like you could calculate the overflow period for a timer when it's reaching its maximum value, you can also do that for a timer when it's reaching this output compare value. So it's going to be the value stored in that OCR1A or B register plus one. Remember way back when we looked at our pretend two-bit timer as an example, it only reached a maximum value of three, but it took a period of four clock ticks to wrap around. So then you multiply that by the prescaler and by that clock tick period of 62.5 nanoseconds, that will give you the period for your interrupts. So now let's go through and look at the code line by line. Starting in the main function, I have my DDRD register, which hopefully you're familiar with by now, that is setting pin seven to an output so I can use it to control the LED. Next, I have my TCCR1A and TCCR1B registers, which you saw in the previous video. I'm using those to do two things. First, I'm using them to set my WGM bits to clear timer on compare mode. So if I hop over to my data sheet, I've got this big table for the WGM bits and all the different modes. I have selected mode four, clear timer on compare. And you'll notice in this top column, instead of the max value of 0x FFFF or 65,535, the top is now OCR1A. So what I showed in the graph a couple minutes ago, the timer is now going to reach that top value and then wrap around and we can pick that value by writing to this register. And I have also selected my prescaler bits. I want a prescaler of 1024 because I've decided for this example, I want to blink the LED every other second. So it's on for a second and off for a second. So I needed to slow the timer down to allow me to get a period that long. So I scroll down to my 
table for the CS bits and see I need to set those to 101 for the prescaler of 1024. Next, I have the OCR1A register. So this is a value that I calculated using that equation for the interrupt period. And here's a good reminder where sometimes it is much more convenient just to write a value in decimal instead of binary. You can use hexadecimal if you're more comfortable with that, but writing this out in binary for all 16 bits would be a huge pain. So you can just write a value to a register in decimal if you want to. So sometimes that makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Again, for DDRD, it's much easier to look at this and just say, oh, I want to write a one to bit seven because that controls bit seven as opposed to figuring out what this value is in decimal. But in this case, when we're thinking about that graph and where we want the interrupt to occur, it's easier just to think about that in decimal so you kind of have a sense of where this is relative to that maximum value of 65,535. Finally, we have the TIMSK1 register, which we have not seen yet. So let's hop over to the data sheet to look at that. So here we have timer counter one interrupt mask register. There are a couple bits we're going to ignore here. We're going to ignore the input capture and overflow enable. We're just going to look at OCIEA and OCIEB. So these are the individual bits that we need to use to enable the interrupts for those output compares. Now it's important to use the bit that corresponds to the output compare register you're using. So we are using OCR1A in our code. That means we need to set the bit OCIEA to one. So there's two different interrupts for each timer. You need to make sure the bit you're enabling corresponds to the output compare register that you are using. So we are going to write this bit to one and that is going to enable the output compare register, sorry, the output compare interrupt for the OCR1A register. Finally, we have our SEI command, which is enabling interrupts globally. Again, if you don't have this, then the interrupt won't work, even if you've written that one in the TIMSK1 register. And then we have our ISR, which is similar to the external and pin change interrupt service routines we saw before. We just have a different argument for the ISR here, which again, we get from our table of interrupt vectors. We look up the one for timer counter one, compare match A. And in this case, it's timer one underscore comp A underscore vect. So we fill that in there. And then that way, this interrupt will be called every time the interrupt is triggered based on the timer hitting this OCR1A value. So for this assignment, we're going to change a couple different things. First, I want you to change the code so you are using OCR1B instead of OCR1A. That will require you to change a few other things in the code to make sure it still works. So you'll need to figure out what those are. Next, change the interrupt period so the LED is on for a quarter second and then off for a quarter second, but do so using the smallest possible prescaler. So it won't necessarily be the prescaler of 1024. You'll have to see if a smaller prescaler value will work and adjust the code accordingly. 